encourage you to keep your Bible open, particularly in the Luke passage to start with. When it comes to Jesus, who do you think he is? And what do you think his main purpose is? And uh, so that we just don't have an academic exercise this morning, how does Jesus' purpose, or how should Jesus' purpose, shape our purpose as a church? Uh, In a way, it seems like a silly question to ask. Um, We can give pat answers. Let me just try and expose our thinking a bit more by asking us all some questions. Um, Do you expect Jesus and the mission of his church uh, to be there to remove sin, sickness, sorry, from our lives? Do you expect Jesus and us to give us, as followers of him, um, uh, illness-free living? Do you expect Jesus to make your life better, easier? We live in a culture that is deeply focused on making life better and easier, individualistically maybe, but that is their focus. The greatest good that I could achieve culturally is comfortable, secure expression of myself. So that I can feel good about myself. And we might be tempted as members of our culture to ask the question, how does following Jesus make me better, me feel better, me live better? I think in the passage we get to today in Luke chapter 4, Luke introduces us to the real reason why Jesus came. And it's important for us to understand that because the reason Jesus came should shape what we live for as his people, what our mission as followers of Jesus should be. So why don't I pray for us and then we'll jump into the passage. Our Lord and our God, we uh, keep thanking you just for the opportunity that we have at this time to be able to gather together uh, freely, to gather together with your word in the language that we understand best, to be able to gather together to encourage and spur one another on, And, Lord, to be able to gather together so that your word might speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord God, that your spirit will remove distractions and open our hearts to receive your word well. We pray, Lord God, that you will use us as individuals and as a church in your mission and that we won't be involved in the wrong mission. We ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Luke chapter 4, verse 31, Jesus has travelled down, literally, from Nazareth to Capernaum. Uh, Google Maps last Tuesday told me that if I wanted to walk that distance, it would take me eight and a half hours, and it was downhill. I've got a picture of it, that one there. Um, Now, I don't know whether that's exactly the the track that Jesus walked, and it doesn't really matter, but that's now called the Jesus Trail, and you can walk that track next time you're in the Middle East in Jerusalem, want to work from... Nazareth down to Capernaum and you see the topography you can see why you don't want to walk from Capernaum to Nazareth 200 meters below sea level 400 meters above sea level I'd want to walk downhill at least if I was riding a bike if nothing else so we know uh, last week that Jesus was in Nazareth actually on the Sabbath day wasn't necessarily the week beforehand but last week we saw last week um, a small village the village that Jesus grew up and he was in the synagogue and he read a passage that was handed to him, not one that he thought, oh, these guys need to hear this one. Isaiah 61 handed to him and it spoke of the coming of the Messiah. And then incredibly, this Jesus that we'd seen grow up around the synagogue of Capernaum, oh, sorry, Nazareth, stood up and said that he, that son of Joseph, was the one that this passage had been speaking about. He was the one that was going to be fulfilling the messianic prophecy. But things didn't go down too well if you were here last week. Uh, I was live streaming, so I was able to listen in. A great benefit, isn't it? Welcome to those on live stream again. Um, and so the people in the Capernaum in uh, Nazareth didn't like what Jesus said. Um, they didn't accept, believe him, didn't accept his claim. And they, they wanted Jesus to be a miracle worker for them, to prove who he was. But what did Jesus do? He rebuked them, didn't he? And he rebuked them by telling them, well, 
God sends people to non-Christians when, or to the non-Jews when the Jewish people didn't want to accept him and he sent, he's not sending me to you because I know you're not going to accept me. And they, they backed up what Jesus said because when Jesus exposed their hearts, what did they try and do? Throw him off a cliff. They didn't try and argue the point, say, no, we really want to find out who you are, Jesus. No, they just they didn't like what he said and tried to get rid of him. Now, in chapter 4, verse 31, Jesus is now down at Capernaum. It might not be exactly the, day, the following Sabbath, it's just another Sabbath day. And this time in the synagogue of Capernaum, he is teaching people, and we don't know that he's re- what, what scroll he's reading from this time, but we read in verse 32 that this was a Sabbath day service not to miss. Because in verse 32, people are blown away with the authority of Jesus' words. We're not told what he said. Could have been what he said the week before. Could have had the same scroll or a different scroll handed to him. What we do know from the way that Jesus taught is he did teach with authority. It's recognised here. But other times when Jesus speaks, he says, I say to you, He references himself as the source of authority. Now, you might have noticed that as we open God's word each week, the authority lies in Scripture, not in what I say. Well, the rabbis in the synagogues were very similar, except they didn't reference Scripture as the authority. They referenced what other rabbis said. So they didn't necessarily use themselves as, and they very rarely use themselves as source of authority. But when Jesus spoke, he said, I say to you, And people are amazed at the authority of his word. Uh, As the Sabbath day service progressed, uh, the authority and power of Jesus' words is demonstrated once again. A demon-possessed man gets up and cries out at the top of his voice, go away, you don't, you don't, or what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I've never had that happen on a Sunday service. For a couple of reasons. Probably the biggest one is I'm not the Holy One of God that he's referring to. But you, see, you see, can you imagine that? That would, that would just impact everyone there. There's everyone in Capernaum now knows, good Jews would all know that this has happened on the Sabbath. And as readers of Luke's gospel, it might not be a really surprising thing that this demon-possessed man says, because we read uh, after the resurrection what Jesus has done. We know about Jesus, don't we? We, We are people who know who he is and know what he's doing, And we can just assume that that's what the people in Capernaum knew as well. But they didn't. They're trying to work out who Jesus is. They're still trying to work out what Jesus is here for. In fact, they they seem to know less about Jesus than the demon-possessed man. Or the demons in the man. Imagine the commotion this would have caused. Just after this man has bellowed out, you could probably hear a pin drop. And he says, Jesus, we don't want you here, for you are the Holy One of God. What does he he mean by that? Well, we could make up some stuff, because it's not very clear, is it? The phrase is used in the Old Testament. It's used for uh, Aaron in, in the Old Testament. It's used for Samson. used for Elisha. That's a vague group of people, isn't it? Now, what do we know, at least what he's saying? The Holy One of God, you, that Jesus has something to do with serving God, he's been sent by God, and he seems to have divine-like origins. He's sent by God, the Holy One himself. Now, that, that's vague. We could pass it off if we wanted to. But immediately in the synagogue, the people see the power and authority of Jesus' words, not just as a teacher, but the power and authority of his words over the evil spirit in this man he can order the evil spirit out of this man and the evil spirit comes out and notice we read that the evil spirit throws him down we don't know how far he threw him through him but he threw him down and couldn't hurt him 
last two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, last week it might have been, um, no, it was two weeks ago, I think, um, Jesus was tempted by Satan and Satan offered Jesus power and authority, didn't he? And Jesus didn't take it up from Satan. In fact, in fact Satan said, if you jump off here, nah, well, you know, your angels will protect you. Um, God's angels will protect you. And here we see people recognising the authority that Jesus already has and the inability of Satan's co-workers to do anything to hurt this bloke. The people are even more amazed. The words of Jesus in both his teaching and authority in healing this demon-possessed man are authoritative and powerful. Just a word. No hocus-pocus. They would remember what happened. News about this spread all over the region. And it's worthwhile us reminding ourselves, why is Luke recording this stuff? Well, remember he's writing to Theophilus. He's writing to Theophilus so that Theophilus may know the certainty of the events that happened, the things that he's been taught about who Jesus is. This has been done in public. This has been done in the Jewish synagogue two, week, two weekends, not necessarily in a row. You could go to Capernaum. And you could hear, you could, may even be able to go to Capernaum and speak to some of the people that Jesus has healed. And you may even meet the bloke who's been, um, had the demon, demon um, cast out of him. The Jewish writings of this time say that Jesus is a doer of startling deeds. They say that Jesus is a sorcerer, giving the power and authority to do these deeds to Satan. But they never deny Jesus' authority over sickness and the demonic. They just refuse to recognise that he's the Messiah. And even, evil, even the evil spirits know where he comes from. Let's get back to the passage. Because we might be tempted to think it would be better to be in the, house of, in the synagogue at Capernaum than to be associated with the synagogue at Nazareth. But the people at Capernaum get Jesus wrong too. That really eventful Sabbath morning, Jesus heads to the home of Simon Peter and at the request of his family, Jesus does the second healing on a Sabbath. He'll get in trouble for this in a few chapters' time. Simon Peter's mother-in-law has a high fever and they ask Jesus to heal her. We're not told whether that fever is going to kill her. We're not told, we know that they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have Panadol. And this woman gets up immediately, I think reflecting both the complete healing and her gratitude, and waits on the people, waits on Jesus and his disciples. And the good Jews of the town, after the Sabbath has ended at sunset, verse 40, the crowds then come with all their sick people. They don't want to miss this opportunity. And Luke records that Jesus heals every one of them with a touch, and he's still going at sunrise the next morning. Sick people and demon-possessed people. The demons come out of the demon-possessed people and the sick people are healed. And when the demons come out of the, the demon-possessed people, uh, they, they, they're shouting that Jesus is the Son of God. But we're told that Jesus wouldn't let them know that he was the Messiah. That could be little less Son of God because every good Jew was a Son of God. Could be capital S Son of God. Now as we as readers know it's both. But the people of Capernaum wouldn't have necessarily joined the dots. And at daybreak, Jesus is probably exhausted from the night's events and he goes to a solitary place. We read a, a chapter later in verse, chapter 5, verse 16, that Jesus often went to solitary places to, places to pray. But this particular place wasn't lonely enough and people track him down and the people of Capernaum ask Jesus to stay. They want Jesus, they plead with Jesus to stay. Remember the people in Nazareth? Go away, Jesus. We want to kill you. We don't want you around here when you're telling people this dangerous stuff about us. And the people at Capernaum, well, everyone likes a powerful healer, don't they? Everyone likes a good teacher. Could you imagine if I got sick next week, I'd be able to go to Jesus. I'd be able to get my healing done. And if I had a tricky theological question, well, the rabbi at the temple, he's a dead set waste of time, isn't he? I could ask Jesus. They didn't want Jesus to go. They wanted him for him themselves. You see, both, both synagogues get Jesus wrong. Jesus says in chapter 4, verse 43, this is why I've got to go. 
This is why you've misunderstood who I am. Verse 43. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that's why I've been sent. I wasn't sent here just to remain here as your personal doctor and teacher. Now, Luke's gospel has just, in that verse, introduced us to the kingdom of God. And Luke's gospel will go on 37 more times to just keep hammering away at this kingdom of God stuff. It's a developing and central theme to who Jesus is and what the mission of Jesus is all about. So what does it mean to speak about the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God? We'll see as we unpack Luke's gospel that's got a lot to do with bringing the salvation that Jesus wins on the cross and offering it to people for the forgiveness of their sins, restoring them back into a right relationship with God as king. Colossians chapter 1, our second reading, chapter 1 verse 13 says, Jesus, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So know this really clearly. Jesus wants the people of Capernaum to know and us to know. He didn't come just to heal people. And he didn't even come just to download information and teach a group of people. He came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And as we see, he came to establish that kingdom for eternity. The means by which that kingdom is good news. And that was a message for the people of Nazareth. It's a message for the people of Capernaum. And Jesus says this is a message that everyone in Judea needs to hear. And by the end of Luke's gospel, we'll see that it's a message for all the nations. And guess what? That's a message for us 2,000 years later. For all people today. A message that people need to hear the good news of the kingdom. Because our problem is not poor health. Our problem is not bad teaching. Our problem is a broken relationship with the king. The sovereign king of all the universe. So what does it mean for us to be taking the good news of the kingdom to all the nations? Well, we're going to see as we work our way through Luke's gospel what kingdom living, how radically different it is, what it looks like and how radically different it is. We're going to see actually what the message of the kingdom, uh, not just how it's established, but what people need to hear about it as we work through the gospel. But I'm going to pause there because we'll be looking at that in the coming weeks. And I want us just to pause and ask a couple of questions from this passage and then look and see how this passage might challenge us as followers of Jesus today. Now the first question is this. These are my questions, but they may well be yours. Are demons real? You see, some people think that when the Bible speaks of someone being demon-possessed, it's just an ignorant way of referring to someone who's sick. Our Western culture certainly believes, it's called chronological snobbery, that the people of the past didn't know much and so they just thought that that person was demon-possessed but they really just had a headache. When I lived in Lightning Ridge, uh, Peter, who was the head of the mental health unit, told me that Jesus did nothing really all that miraculous in his healings. He simply did the same today as Panadol and and, um, antibiotics might do for us today. Now, Peter was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. But he had written Jesus off as being nothing more than a pill popper. I want to suggest to you that the people that Luke is speaking about are people who are more than just sick people. Jesus does heal sick people. But when Luke refers to a demon-possessed person, he's referring to someone who is more than just sick. The people have an evil, and I put what is evil, opposed to God, that's what my definition of evil is, supernatural, spiritual power inside them. And we see that Jesus casts that out of them. And there's a separation between the person and the evil, supernatural, spiritual power inside them. 
Now, remember, Luke's a physician. He's not stupid. He knows what a sick person's like, and he knows what a, spirit, a, a demon-possessed person's like. He's not stupid. Can I point out to you when Jesus drove demons out of people, and I'll pick up on something that Peter, in like the guy in Lightning Ridge, was referring to, is that the people that he healed from demon possession were not just people struggling with mental health stuff. It's not schizophrenia or it's not someone suffering a mental illness or an intense spiritual depression. Now, Jesus heals those. That's a physical illness. And Jesus can heal those. But that's separate from speaking about someone who's demon-possessed. And it's really important that you understand that difference too. So why don't we see evil spirits in Adelaide? Uh, my simple answer is that I think Satan's doing a good enough job keeping Western materialists consumed with materialism and thinking there's no spiritual world. You see, if there were spiritual beings present in Adelaide regularly, demon-possessed people present in Adelaide regularly, people in Adelaide would be asking far better spiritual questions than they are now. It'd be a bit sort of like egg on the face for Richard Dawkins. There's no such thing as a supernatural world, he claims. Well, a demon-possessed person might be a bit of egg on the face for that. You see, Satan wouldn't want to undermine his own effort, would he? And so we don't have many of Satan's co-workers. Um, evident in Adelaide, in Western culture, uh, even broadly. But if you're involved in what I would call more spiritually-minded cultures, you often don't need convincing of the fact that there is evil spirits. So there's my short answer to why there's probably not lots of evil spirits around in Adelaide, but that's not saying they're not here. And I just don't think it's in our face as much as it was in the synagogue of Nazareth of Capernaum. Sorry. Uh, my, ne my next question is this: uh, Why does Jesus stop these evil spirits from proclaiming who he is? Uh, surely it would be great advertising to have the opposition acknowledge you who, who you are. Um, my answer to that question is: If you read through the rest of Luke's gospel, you'll realise that this is just a matter of timing. Before Jesus dies on the cross and rises again, Jesus often told people, well, whether they be people he'd healed or stopped demon-possessed people or demons out of demon-possessed people, he often stopped them from telling people who he was. And I think the reason for that is that Jesus uh, just wanted to get on with the task that he was set for, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, people had the wrong idea of what a Messiah was going to do. They thought a Messiah was going to establish a Jewish kingdom on earth and get rid of the Romans. And Jesus didn't need a whole pile of military, militaristic people following him, trying to establish him, really their perception of the kingdom of God. The reason I think is that, is that but I also think Jesus, when you see Jesus prior and uh, up to the de his death and resurrection, his focus is actually, whilst it's on telling people and warning people and preparing people, it's primarily on teaching his disciples. See, see, Jesus didn't write books and didn't run his own church service. Jesus equipped his disciples to go out into all the nations once he'd risen from the dead, proclaiming the message of the kingdom that was central to what he was on about. And that seems to be where his focus is. After Jesus rose from the dead, when we get to the end of Luke's gospel, it won't be this week, uh, Jesus told his followers, don't keep this message silent. So that includes us. Uh, Jesus is not saying to us, don't tell anyone who I am. Jesus is saying to us, because we live after the resurrection, go out and tell everyone. So we've addressed my two questions. Let's look at how this might ch passage might challenge us. Um, you and I might want to identify ourselves as more likely to be in the synagogue of Capernaum than the synagogue of Nazareth. And I want to suggest to you that both of them get Jesus wrong. You see, Nazareth wanted to kill Jesus. They didn't like what he said. Capernaum wanted to keep Jesus as their therapeutic God, their therapeutic teacher and healer. And I think that same danger lurks for us today. You know, 
We get consumed with Christianity that's going to make us feel better. We live in a culture that is consumed with about feeling better. And we, and it's often talked about in churches, what a God who will give us a comfortable, democratic, middle-class lifestyle. And I don't think Jesus came to do that. In fact, I think he makes it very clear here, that's not why he came. Jesus is not your own personal therapy God. He's not there to make you comfortable. He's not there to make you middle class. He's not there to heal you every time you get sick. And yet that can be a message that it comes from God's people regularly. Jesus came. What did he come to do? He came to rescue us from our sin by proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And if we don't lose sight of that, then we won't be tempted to go off and find, follow those therapeutic views, versions of Christianity. Western Christians, our country, Christians want their democratic rights, their Western lifestyle, their personal freedoms, their feelings of well-being. And I think they have misunderstood the purpose of Jesus. Now, the reason why this is important for us to understand is that Satan was very happy for rubbish gospels to be proclaimed. He did not like the good news of the kingdom be proclaimed. And his evil spirits didn't like Jesus proclaiming the message of the kingdom. And Satan does not like us proclaiming the message of the kingdom today. He will try and distract us. And he sadly has succeeded many times. He will distract us from the purpose that Jesus is here for and the message that Jesus wants us to proclaim to a world that desperately needs to know Jesus. If we understand that, then when our world gets turned upside down because we want to proclaim the message of the kingdom, we will not be surprised. When your personal comforts are not being met because you want to proclaim the message of the kingdom, you should not be surprised. Satan does not like it. Second thing, just note here, really clearly, ultimate power and authority in Jesus is found in his word. No evil, no sickness can stand, can stop Jesus' cause advancing. And as Colossians 1 verse 12 says, we've been rescued to an inheritance as his holy people into the kingdom of light. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The authority that we have is not in me, it's not in you, it's in the word of God. Word of God. Don't lose heart. And don't give up holding on to God's word. Don't replace God's word with a more therapeutic message or some temporary buzz that will not last. And don't stop speaking of the kingdom. That is where our hope lies. Actually where anyone's hope lies. There is no other name by which we have been saved. That's my final point. Don't stop speaking of the kingdom. Don't stop sharing the message of what Jesus has done to bring us back into a right relationship with the king. We're going to be unpacking that as we go through Luke, get more detail to that, what it means to live and how radically the message of the kingdom should be changing what we do. But don't stop speaking the message of the kingdom. Jesus didn't stop and neither should we. Let's pray, shall we? Our loving Heavenly Father, we think of those people that we know who from us, we might well be the only ones that they hear the message of the kingdom. Lord, we pray that we will not mix up the message of the kingdom. We won't have a therapeutic Jesus. Lord, we pray that we might be people who proclaim a king that we have been reconciled to through the work of Jesus on the cross. Give us words to say 
so that we join the dots and connect where people scratch where people are itching. Lord, we pray that your spirit might prepare hearts to hear the message of the kingdom. We thank you for your word and that reminder that we can get Jesus wrong and we can get his mission wrong. Keep shaping our lives that we might live for your glory in a world that desperately needs Jesus. Amen.